And as you can see from the title of Study 7, we have a, a large ground to cover. So I'm going to have to be very quick on some of these kinks, but it's important for us to see where they fit in the scheme of things. So we look at again at our chart here. At uh, This chart shows you the area that we're dealing with in, in the chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah. We're still in that same period of the reign of Ahab and his successors, his sons, and of Jehoshaphat uh, and uh, Joash. Eventually, of course, uh, we're going to see how important he is. But I want to just take you now to Micaiah's prophecy of doom. So we need to go back to Second of Chronicles, chapter 18. You might recall I mentioned that we would return to this area and have a look at what Micaiah prophesies. And we saw the far-reaching implications uh, of his prophecy uh, by looking at Micah, who bears the same name. So Second Chronicles 18, and we're going to pick this record up in, in verse... 16. Now this is where Micaiah begins to prophesy to, to Ahab and to Jehoshaphat sitting in the gate of Samaria. And this is what he said. I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd, not even Jehoshaphat. That's the point he's making. Not even Jehoshaphat. The great shepherd of the sheep. The one who in chapter 17 has done so much to encourage and educate his people not even he is going to be a shepherd at the end of this disaster and Yahweh said these have no master the word master of course is Adon these have no lord let them return therefore every man to his house in peace so he sees the nation scattered I saw all Israel scattered upon the mountains so this combined army is doomed. They're scattered in defeat without a leader. Ahab was going to be dead and Jehoshaphat weakened and shamed because of the compromise that he had made which led to this disaster. His, his army of 1,160,000 men decimated. All of that lost. No shepherd, no master. This is a real indictment of his policies, of his change of direction that we've seen. Let them return, every man in peace. This is going to be picked up in verse, nine, in verse 1 of chapter 19. Just cast your eyes across to, to chapter 19 and verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. So Micaiah's words are fulfilled. It's a very strange sequel, isn't it, to a lost war. <laughs> you lost the war, lost your army, but you returned to your house in peace. Very, very strange. So what's that about? What's well, about Yahweh being merciful to this man, giving him another opportunity to start again, to act more sensibly this time, to recover himself. And so we see the, the, the grace of our God being extended to him because of his quality. Let's come to verse uh, 17 and 18 of Second Chronicles 18. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? He hated this man. And again he said, This is Micaiah speaking, Therefore hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said, Who shall entice Ahab king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying after this manner, and another saying after that manner, which is what you've just been doing out around your tables. You know? You've been having a little bit of a council. I think that means this. I think, got the sense of what's happening here? This is one of the most astonishing scenes that you'll ever read about in the Word of God. You know, I know some brethren have a problem with this. Oh, no, that can't happen in heaven. This is exactly what happens in heaven. And it's going to happen again in the kingdom age. We're not going to be automatons, clones in the kingdom. The angels are not clones. When God sent them forth in Genesis chapter 1 to do a work, he gave them a plan. But he also gave them some liberty to use their brains. What, what angel would come up with a platypus or a kangaroo? All right? You don't have platypus and kangaroo in North America, do you? Because much more dangerous creatures. 
But you see, God gave these angels certain liberties within the bounds of his plan. He said, right, use your brains. I want some kind of interest here. Use your brains. And that's what the angels do. They did it then, they do it here. So when God wants an objective achieved, he says, this is what I want to achieve. Now what do you think? And and what do you think? Give me some suggestions. And he says, right, that's the one. That's the one we're going to run with. And away they go and perform it. It's an astonishing revelation of the way God operated with his angels. And now, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is doing the same with the angels. He's the one in charge of the angelic host. And so he's going to do the same with you and me, who will be as the angels of the future age. We'll have opportunities within the bounds of what has to be accomplished. Out you go. Use your grey matter. That's what it's about. So I think this is marvellous, what we have here. And it it shows, of course, the extraordinary lengths that God went to of trying to turn Jehoshaphat from the decision that he'd made. If only he had woken up in the gate of Samaria when these words were spoken. This is very jarring, this whole thing, isn't it? And he prophets to go away here. And then Ahab says, I hate that Micaiah. You'd think he'd wake up and say, I think I might be in the wrong place. And so God is being very, very gracious to Jehoshaphat by giving him this revelation of what was going on in heaven. Disaster was going to overtake them if they didn't listen course unfortunately sadly it did overtake them so I think verse 18 is well worth contemplating and and the way in which it unfolds from there when Yahweh says well that's what we'll run with you go out and put the lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets of Ahab now we saw what happened here we read verse 28 they went up and the jarring events of uh, Samaria as I said should have warned Jehoshaphat off and we'd like to welcome a couple of uh, newcomers who come all the way from, from Texas. Lovely to have you with us. So we don't need to repeat what we said about Second Chronicles 18 and verses 28 through 29 and 30. Remember how um, the, the, having locked himself up in this, in this prison, so to speak, Jehoshaphat now has got to the point where he's prepared to wear the robes of King Ahab. And we know that that was a very dangerous affair. As the Septuagint, we mentioned the Septuagint's translation of this, Disguise me, says Ahab, and I will enter the battle, and do thou put on my raiment, which we saw was supported by verses 30 and 31. And we saw in verse 31 that they compassed him about, they they surrounded him, uh, because he was wearing the robes of Ahab. He was caught in this vortex of hostile Syrians, all desiring to be the one who would kill the king of Israel that Ben-Hadad might have his revenge. And we saw how God moved them. He reversed the seduction uh, of Ahab to release Jehoshaphat from this predicament. He's being very merciful to him. But that's not why I'm here. I'm not here just because I wanted to repeat myself. I'm here because what flows out of that. So let's let's pick the record up of 2 Chronicles 18 and verse 33. Verse 32 perhaps. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. So where's Ahab? Well he's disguised. He's in a chariot but he's disguised as just one of the ordinary soldiers. So what's God going to do about that? Well... Marvellous thing. A marvellous thing. Now look at verse 33. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Now, what of course he intended was when this arrow struck him between the shoulder joint, as we shall see, the shoulder joint, it went down in and pierced him. Now, he didn't go through his heart because he didn't die straight away. It went through your heart. But you see, he's wounded and he's bleeding. Now he's got chain armour on. And you can't take chain armour off uh, at the height of a battle in, in a chariot. You need to get off the chariot. You need to have some sort of liberty to get this armour off. So Ahab's going to bleed to death slowly. 
It's going to be a slow death for this man. His blood is going to drain out of him. So this is divine judgment. Now that word we read there, at adventure, a certain man drew a bow at adventure. So you've got this Syrian soldier who's probably standing back. He's a bowman. There's other people out there hacking away and so on. He's a bowman. He says, well, I better make... <laughs> I better make some contribution to this war. <laughs> so he pulls out an arrow and he goes, <laughs> and that's what this word means. Simplicity. You know, he says, well, I'll just fire it anywhere and see what happens. This arrow is guided by an angelic hand. And we know this is true because this word that is used here for venture is the Hebrew word tomi. It means complete or completeness. And by extension of that idea, innocence. It is translated integrity ten times, uprightness six times, simplicity once. But the plural form of this word is the interesting part. The plural form of the Hebrew tomi is thumen. And that is rendered five times in the plural form, thummim. Now you know about the Urim and the thummim. Where were they? Behind the breastplate. Where does this arrow end up? Behind his breastplate. Now we're not talking about the high priest's breastplate here, are we? We're talking about his armoured breastplate. What he thinks is going to protect him. From divine judgment. (laughs) And the arrow of divine judgment ends up behind the breastplate. Yeah. You can see what's happening here. Alright. This is the hand of God bringing judgment upon Ahab. He might be disguised as just one of the ordinary soldiers. The king of Syria and his men who who are after him, they can't identify him, but God gets him. You do not escape the divine edict which was, which was delivered by Elijah so well, we've got a military setting here and it is a cameo isn't it because the judgment of Urim and Thummim in the breastplate of the high priest were about divine judgments it's about to fall on Ahab by this simple Syrian bowman who just takes an arrow and fires it anywhere so it says that it got in between the joints of the harness. Now this word joints, debek, means a joint. It is used in Isaiah 41 verse 7 as rendered soldering. Now in Australia we call that soldering. You call it soldering here in North America? Yeah. Well, I don't know. You ever heard of soldering? No, Tim's saying no. Anyway, soldering is where you have, uh, yeah, <laughs> metal, you heat it up and it melts and then it will join wires together or something like that. You'd do that, of course. Okay, so this is a, it's, it's, so it's a pliable, sort of like a pliable substance. You have to have something pliable, don't you? You know, it's joining this part of the armour to that part of the armour. It's got to be pliable. So it can be pierced by an arrow. So the RSV said it got in between the scale armour, or Rotherham's the shoulder joints, or Young's the joining. So it's the weaker join around the shoulder and the armpit of a coat of mail. And that's where this arrow went in. Pierced him and of course he's starting to bleed badly. And he bleeds to death. So he said, the record says in verse 34, the battle increased that day. He's trying to get out. He's trying to get out. But it gets hotter and hotter. There's no way of escape. This man is doomed. He stayed himself up, it says, in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. The RSV puts it, he propped himself up in the chariot as his blood drained from him until the evening. And at sunset, he died. So what happened then? Well, the dogs would lick his blood. I've got 2 Chronicles 18 verse 38 there. I don't have verse 38 in my Bible, so that's clearly a mistake. Clearly a mistake. I mean, kings... Alright, 18 and verse 8. I think, <laughs> I think I mean 1 Kings 22, verse 38. So we need to go there. 
So it's nice to have, this is the first time that we've done this particular series, so it's nice to be able to correct the, the mistakes. So have a look at 2 Kings, uh, sorry, 1 Kings 22. You thought I had a new Bible, didn't you? 38 verses in. <laughs> so 1 Kings chapter 22, and at verse 38 is the one that I want. And it says this, well maybe verse 37. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armour according unto the word of Yahweh which he spoke. Now, the, the, the prophecy of, of Elijah was in, in the vineyard of Naboth, that the dogs will lick the blood of Ahab. So there's a partial fulfilment of, he, of, of that here, but there's something more important. When it says it washed his armour, that's not an accurate translation. This word for armour, zanalf, actually means harlots. Yeah. Probably some of the translations will tell you that. Yep. Harlots. So the, the, the translators have confused this with zoom which means equipment or armour, okay? So it's the plural of zana, which means to commit adultery, and it has the idea of being highly fed and therefore wanton. So Rotherham translates it correctly. Also the harlots bathed there. The RSV is correct. It says, and the harlots washed themselves in this pool. So when they brought the chariot, of Ahab to the pool to wash out the blood, this was the place where the harlots came after their dirty deeds and washed themselves. Now isn't that fitting that we have a man who was given to spiritual whoredom, who married the mother of harlots, so to speak. Jezebel, isn't it fitting that there should be an end like that for this man? As Revelation 2 verse 20 of course points out, this was the man who had introduced into Israel, he filled the land with Jezebel's priestesses who taught Yahweh's people to commit fornication. Very fitting end indeed. So what's the outcome of all of this? Well the outcome of course is that Israel doesn't have a shepherd. Ahab is dead. Jehoshaphat is compromised. He ceases to be a shepherd. So Micaiah's prophecy comes to pass. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, we have Jehoshaphat chastened by his God. So just very quickly come across to 2 Chronicles 19. As I said, he returns in peace. If you have a look at uh, chapter 18 of the 2nd of Chronicles and the final words of Micaiah, you'll see how important the first words of chapter 19 are. And verse 26 of 2 Chronicles 18 and say, thus saith the king, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction. This is, this is the instructions given by Ahab to deal with Micaiah. He's going to be put in prison. And feed him with the bread of affliction and with water of affliction until, until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, verse 27, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not Yahweh spoken by me. And he said, Hearken! All ye people saw the import of those words. And of course, Ahab doesn't return in peace. He returns dead. But Jehoshaphat does return in peace. But look what God does for him in chapter 19 and verse 2. What he does for him is to chastise him. He says to him in verse 2, Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king, Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate Yahweh? You know what that word uh, love is in the Hebrew? Anybody know what the word love is there? Ahab. A-H-A-B. Isn't that interesting? Shouldest thou Ahab, the Ahabs of this world? Goes on to say, Therefore is wrath upon thee from before Yahweh. Nevertheless... Our God is always fair, isn't he? He's righteous. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, 
Either thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. And so you, you can make a new start. I recognise the good things here. You can make a new start. And he does. Chapter 19 is marvellous. It's absolutely marvellous. I mean, human pride could get in the way. It did in the case of King Asa. Got in the way. And Asa was destroyed because of it. Joshua could have said, well, well took umbrage at, what he, at the prophet. As Asa did, he didn't do that. He humbled himself. And he acknowledged that what he had done was wrong. And then, of course, what happens is he, he, he tries to reorder and reorganise the kingdom and put righteous judges in place, as chapter 19 tells us. He's attacked. He's attacked by nations who see his weakness. They see his army has been decimated. They take the opportunity. And so verse 1 of chapter 20 says... But it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And they came and told him and he gathers the whole nation and delivers one of the most beautiful prayers of the Bible. An appeal for help from his God. Now I have to be pretty quick with this because I would love to stop and talk. You can do the whole school of prophets on Jehoshaphat and the things that surround him. You really can. It's huge. We can't do that. we just got to try and pick the ideas out of, out of this. But there's something I want to show you between this chapter, 2 Chronicles 20, and the next time we meet Elisha in, in the record of 2 Kings 3. I want to show you something very interesting. But Jehoshaphat's humble prayer, which you see in verse 5 onwards, this is where he begins the prayer in verse 6, O Yahweh Elohim of our fathers, and so on, wonderful prayer, uh, is what is, is the basis of the triumph that has won over these nations that have come to destroy Judah. The power of praise and not weapons is what wins the conflict that follows. No weapon is lifted by Judah. The only thing that is lifted is their voice. They lift up their voice in praise to their God. And this is an an incredible thing. And so mutual destruction by Judah's enemies, which we read of here in 2 Chronicles 20, if you have a look at verse 23, maybe verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise, Yahweh set ambushment. So they go out with singing and praise. They've got a Levite of the sons of Korah who's leading all of this. They go out with praise, and when they began to sing and praise, Yahweh intervenes on their behalf. And you see here that uh, he set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, the Edomites, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. You know that record. That's, that's Ezekiel 38 and verse 21. Every man's hand against his brother. And so there's mutual destruction. And this prefigures the victory of Armageddon. And Second Chronicles 20 is full of Armageddon. It points to that great day. But the point I want to make is this. The victory is won because of the praise that is given to Yahweh. The total dependence on him. It's associated with music. They're singing. They're playing instruments. You have a look what happens here when they return. Uh, verse uh, 27 of Second Chronicles 20. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them, to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For Yahweh had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of Yahweh. And the fear of God was upon the kingdoms around. And he gave them peace. All to do with praise. Got a picture? Alright. So what we've read here is really pointing us to our future. And that praise that is given to Yahweh in the valley of Berakah, the valley of blessing... And in Jerusalem, is pointing to a greater time. So Judah enjoyed peace and rest and the surrounding nations feared. And Armageddon is fully foreshadowed. Well, I want to show you something in the, in the reign of Jehoram, king of Israel, that harks back to this chapter. And that's all I can say about it. So who is this Jehoram? 
He's the second son of Ahab. His name means Yahweh raised. Now this is where there could be confusion because there's a Jehoram in Judah, the son of Jehoshaphat. Now why do you reckon this happened? Well because they were intermarried. See? So they're naming their children the same names as the other family. This is just one of the spin-offs of that compromise. He reigns for 12 years, part of that. <coughs> uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we think the 12 years is, is, uh, is a full 12 years, but part of that, of course, he is so dreadfully unwell that he can't do anything. And in the end, he dies from uh, dysentery. His bowels fall out by reason of his... Uh, no, I'm talking about Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat there. I got the wrong... I got mixed up, see? Jehoram's. Jehoram dies, the son of Jehoshaphat dies from his bowels falling out. This man is the second son of Ahab. He's a little better than his brother Ahaziah. So, what about him? Well, I want you to come to 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings 3. In this record of 2 Kings 3, we've got Jehoram described in verse 1. Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria eight, in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And verse 2 tells us that he wasn't quite as bad as his brother. He wrought evil in the sight of Yahweh, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his, that, that his father had made. So, whereas Ahaziah simply picked up and ran with the Baal worship of Ahab and Jezebel, this man said, no, that's not for me. So he puts Baal aside and returns to the worship of Jeroboam. Verse 3. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And then trouble starts. Verse 4. There's a revolt of the king of Moab had been subject to Israel. And so Jehoram decides that he needs the support of Israel. His army is weak. And so he numbers all Israel and he went and sent to Jehoshaphat in verse 7, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has revolted against me. Come and help me. And look at what Jehoshaphat says in verse 7. He says the very same words that he spoke in the gate of Samaria to Ahab. He said, I will go up, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And so begins another round, terrible round. This is the third one, where he makes the same mistake again. But, this time, Elisha is in the host as they go up. And you read about this as we go on in verse 9. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. What an alliance that is. And they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host. So there's a problem. And the king of Israel said, This is all God's fault. Verse 10. Alas, Yahweh hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. It's all God's fault. And Jehoshaphat says, Well, is there not a prophet of Yahweh here? Does this sound familiar to you? <laughs> well, thankfully, there was again a prophet of Yahweh and we read of him at the end of verse 11 because the answer comes back here is Elisha the son of Shaphat which poured water on the hands of Elijah and we saw what that meant in spiritual terms the symbol of the cleansing of works what you do with your hands by the word of God let's read on and Jehoshaphat said in verse 12, The word of Yahweh is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I got to do with you? If it was not for the presence of Jehoshaphat, verse 14, if he wasn't here, I would not look you in the face. I want nothing to do with you. Belong to the house of Ai. I want nothing to do with you. That's not a good start, is it? But then look what happens. Verse 15. But 
over there, bring me a minstrel. Huh? What's that about? Bring me a minstrel. Was Elisha one who sat down and listened to classical music? Or what was that? Was that this is music before dinner or whatever? No. It's obvious what he's doing, isn't it? He's saying to Jehoshaphat, Do you remember? Do you remember when you were attacked by the nations around who saw your weakness and you prayed to Yahweh and you gave him praise and honour and glory and you went out to battle playing instruments of music and singing praise to him that he gave you the triumph? You remember that? Yeah. He's saying, go back and think about what happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. That's what he's saying. The victory was won by praise to Yahweh. That's why he says, bring me a minstrel. The word means to thrum, to beat a tune with the fingers. Play a stringed instrument. It is extremely strange request, isn't it? But we can see its purpose. Meant to take him back to that wonderful victory in the Second Chronicles chapter 20. Well, I'm going to leave that there and we'll press on now with Jehu because the next major work that Elisha is involved in here is the anointing of Jehu which is going to bring judgment upon the house of Ahab. So let's come to the record of Second Kings chapter 9. Second Kings 9 and at verse 1 we read this. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins. So here's someone who's been attending the schools of the prophets. Okay, So he's fitted for the work. So he calls one of these young men. He says, Gird up your loins, which of course Peter says is all about girding up the loins of your mind. And take this box of oil in thy hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now that's where the army of Israel was at the time. They were trying to defend their borders against the Syrians. And the captain, one of the principal captains, was of course Jehu. Verse 2. When thou comest thither, look out there, Jehu, the son of Nimshi. So he's he's to be isolated. Uh, from that group and it's a very unusual story this look what happens here find Jehu the son of Nimshi and go in and make him arise from among his brethren and carry him into an inner chamber then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say thus saith Yahweh I have anointed thee king over Israel then open the door and flee and tarry not it's rather strange, isn't it? But there's a purpose in this. And Jehu uses this very, very wisely. He's very street smart, this man. So, verses 6 to 10 describe what happens. He comes in, let's just pick it up from verse 4. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. So they're all equals. They're captains. They're all equals. And they're sitting together. He said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. Get a picture in your mind. You're all equals. Alright? You're all captains. And in comes this young man and says, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu says, Me? You mean me? <laughs> look at what he's look, look, He is very smart, this guy. Just let's read this record. And he arose and went into the house, verse 6, and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of Yahweh, even over Israel. Now I want to stop there. Did you see what it said? Israel was in apostasy. They had Baal worship in place, put aside by Jehoram for a while, but they were in apostasy. They're still the people of Yahweh. They're still part of the brotherhood. 
need to remember that. It's telling us something. The way God looked upon the situation. Oh yeah, they're in apostasy. He's going to bring judgment. He still regards them as his people because he has a future for them down the track. And so verse 7, And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab. And he's given the instructions about destroying the house of Ahab. That will perish utterly, verse 8 tells us. They'll be made like the house of Jeroboam, verse 9. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel. And then it says, And there shall be none to bury her. It's not talking about the fact there's nobody who will take the trouble to bury her. It's talking about the fact there was nothing to bury except the skull and hands and feet which represented her ways. The dogs ate everything else. Nothing to bury. And he opened the door and fled. So when these other captains, they've seen, they seen Jehu go in, right? and then this young fellow opens the door and <coughs> flees like anything. What's going on here? Let's read the story. Verse 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is everything okay? He, he said unto him, well, this madman is all well. Wherefore came this madman to thee? And he said unto him, You know the man. You know this man, don't you? And you know what he came to tell me, don't you? Well, of course they didn't. You see what he's doing here? He's a very smart guy. He's a cunning guy. He is using this situation, this opportunity, to put them in their places. Don't you know who he is? No, we have no idea. And then he tells them what he had been told. And you see, he's prepared their mind. They think they're equals. He's going to assume the role of king. And we read there in verse 12 that they said, It's false. We don't know this man. And he said, Thus and thus spake he unto me, saying, Thus said Yahweh, I have anointed thee king of Israel. Then they hasted and took every man his garment, put it under him on the top of the stairs, and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. Very, very subtle the way he approaches this, even though, of course, he knew. He knew his assertion was untrue. Look at verse 15. The king Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. And Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. If it be your minds. So this ruthless and impatient spirit is concealed behind the facade of what we call on the screen egalitarianism. This is designed for Robbie, who increases vocabulary. But of course, egalitarianism is what the world hails today, don't they? It comes from the French word egality. Egality is equality. So it's liberty, you know, equality, fraternity. So it's all about equality. So he uses this facade of egalitarianism. You know the man, don't you? Huh? If it be your minds, he has no intentions of listening to anybody else. He knows exactly what he's going to do, and he knows exactly how he's going to do it. He's a ruthless operator, is Jehu. So who is he? Well, here he is. His name means Yah is he. He reigns for 28 years, from 841 to 814 BC. His father is actually Jehoshaphat, Yahweh's judge. He's also called the son of Nimshi, which means extricated, who was in fact his grandfather. He's contemporary with Ahaziah, with Athaliah, and with Joash, kings of Judah. And he has a work to do. He slays Jehoram, Ahaziah, and Jezebel in this same chapter, 2 Kings chapter 9. In verses 16 to 26... Jehoram is slain at Jezreel and there are a couple of things of course which stick out of the record you look at verse 20 and the watchman said as they approach the city the watchman is told saying he came in and cometh not again so they send out, Jehoram sends out horsemen the horsemen arise to Jehu's coming army and he says what have you got to do with peace get behind me and come back, then another one he doesn't come back so as they get closer, 
the watchman says in verse 20, The driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Ninshi, for he driveth furiously. Now, it doesn't mean he's speeding. All right? It does not mean he's speeding. Because if he was speeding, if he was galloping his chariot horse, then he would have arrived at the city before the two horsemen came out to him. See? The horsemen came out while he's approaching. But there's two of them. So he's not speeding. So what does it mean? Well, it means that he has a, he has a distinctive and characteristic way of driving a chariot. You know people that drive cars quite characteristically and distinctively and you don't want to be anywhere near them on the road, okay? Well, that's what... He had some kind... He, I don't, we don't know what it was, whether he was doing this, that kind of thing, but it, it, he was distinctive in the way he drove a chariot. Nobody else did it that way. And, of course, we read in verse 26 <coughs> something interesting as well. Because when they kill Jehoram, verse 25, Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite, for remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, Yahweh laid this burden upon him. So Jehu was present when Elijah condemned Ahab in the, in the vineyard of Naboth. In 1 Kings 21. He was there. He heard the words of Elijah and now he's fulfilling them. But there's something else. Look at verse 26. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Uh, you don't read about that, do you, in 1 Kings 21. So when Jezebel sent her letters to the, to the elders of Jezreel and said, Set Naboth on high. In other words, promote him. Put him up on, on a pedestal and then bowl him over and stone him to death. They didn't stop at Naboth. Well, because if Naboth's dead, who gets his inheritance? His sons. So they've got to kill him off too. And read about that. But you read about it here. Because Jehu was a witness and probably was the one who did the killing. In the end of the day, elders of Jezreel... We don't know where he was, but he probably was involved in some way. He knew about this. He knew the history. He knew that it was going to happen. He might have been involved. Who knows? And so, in verses 27 and 29, Ahaziah dies at Megiddo. So he's killed Jehoram, the son of Ahab. He's killed now Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, at Megiddo. And then verses 30 to 37, he deals with Jezebel. She's trampled to death by his horses. Now, again, we've got limited time, but let's just run through some of the points here in verse 30 onwards. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out of the window. Painted her face? Yes. You know what the, you know what the Hebrew words are for painted her face? Seem puke. <laughs> Seem puke. Sounds great, doesn't it? So she's using this blue stibium, this dye, bluish, whitish sort of paint on her eyes, you know, and probably using those false eyelashes or whatever. I mean, she's, she's got to be getting on a bit now. You know, she's over the hill, but she still thinks she can seduce Jehu. She knows this man. I mean, she, she's had a lot of experience with this man. She thinks she can do the job. And so she tired her head. Now that word in the Hebrew, yatab, means to adorn or to ornament. So she's fluffing up her hair and getting herself ready. And she looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? She can't control herself. And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who was on my side? Two eunuchs look out. He said, Throw her down. And they do throw her down. And she scrabbles on the wall. Verse 33. They threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall. And on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. So she's, she's grabbing at the wall. And this is causing blood to, to, to scatter. As her skin is broken open. And it, 
Some of that falls on the horses below. So what does he do? He tramples her underfoot. She dies under the feet of horses, as we saw. This is the basis of of Revelation uh, chapter 19, the destruction of the Jezebel system in the latter days. And the dogs, of course, come along because Jehu goes off to have a fellowship meal with the elders of the city. Verse 36. Sorry, verse um, 34. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull, the brain, inside the skull. No dog's going to eat that. And the feet, her walk, and the palms of her hands, her works. Indigestible, even to filthy dogs. They left it. So corrupt was this woman. Now I've got one or two more points to make. I want to have a look at Jehu and Jehonadab at work in chapter 10. Again, it's too big. Too big to do any more than than, uh, just pick out a couple of points. But what happens, of course, at the beginning of chapter 10 is that Jehu sends messengers from Jezreel, where he's just put Jezebel to death, to Samaria, where the elders of Jezreel have taken refuge. They've been... Obviously, they've left Jezreel. They're now in Samaria. So he sends letters to the elders of Jezreel, who were the ones that Jezebel wrote to from Samaria, saying, kill Nabal. Got it? So this is divine poetic justice. And 70 sons and grandsons of Ahab are collected together and their heads lopped off. And brought up to Jezreel with a big pile in the vineyard of Nabal. So there's divine poetic justice going on here. But then you see, Jehu's going to go on and deal with the house of Ahab. And he's going to deal with the worshippers of Baal. And that's the story of verse 15 onwards in 2 Kings chapter 10. Now the man we want to meet here is this man of verse 15. And when he, Jehu, was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, says Jehu, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up to him into the chariot. Now that word chariot in the Hebrew, Merkaba, simply means a vehicle. A chariot. But not the next one. Verse 16. And he said, Come up, come with me and see my zeal for Yahweh. So they made him ride in his chariot. Recap. That's what that word chariot is, Rekeb, R-E-K-E-B. Rekeb means a vehicle, but it also means to ride in a vehicle. And that word ride that precedes it, so they made him ride in his chariot, is Rekeb, the root of Rekeb. Now why is this important? You know what they called Elijah and Elisha? My father... My father, the chariot, the rekeb of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. Well, Jehu's just used the chariot to destroy Jezebel, pointing to a greater time. And our Lord Jesus Christ will destroy that system. Okay, and what are they doing here? Going out to destroy Baal worshippers, riding in the chariot of deity? Jehu, Yar is he? Yeah. You see how this is all pointing forward. But you see, there's a problem. And the problem is this. Jehonadab thinks that Jehu is going to reform the nation and return them to the original truth of their religion. And he's very disappointed. 
It's a good start, but he's disappointed because when Jehu arrives at Samaria and he finds this glorious palace and a huge wine cellar, as we've said, we've said earlier in our studies, it's the end of it. His reformation comes to, the, comes to an end at the, at the mouth of a bottle. You know, he's, he's, on the, he's on the drink. The drunkards of Ephraim have overtaken him. And so his, his reformation doesn't happen. Jehonadab is terribly disappointed. So what does he do? You know what Jehonadab does. He lays down a law for his family that they would drink no wine, that they would not plant crops, they would not build houses, they would be pilgrims in the land. He saw the reformation of Jehu come to an end on, on, the, on the basis of prosperity and drunkenness. And he says, no, that's not going to be for my family. And the marvellous, incredible thing is that his family was keeping that law that he laid down 250 years later. And because of it, stayed in the land when the rest of the nation went into captivity. Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, the rider, was the father of the house of the Rechabites of Jeremiah 35. It's another huge story, which we don't have time to pursue, but this is the man. You know what his name means? His name, Jehonadab, means whom Yahweh impels. And Nadab in the Hebrew, has the idea of willingness. It has the idea of offering yourself willingly without having to be compelled to do anything. That's the idea of that word. So here is a man who is in the record for one reason, that we might see ourselves in him. You know why? The Gentiles. This family is a Gentile family. They're actually the Kenites. We know that from 1 Chronicles 2.55. They're Kenites, faithful to the end. And so ought we to be. A lot more could be said about Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, and his family, but that'll have to do. What I think you, I want you to take away from this session, if nothing else, is this, that what God wants, he found in Jehonadab. He also found it in Jehu, but Jehu, Jehu had a wrong spirit. <clears throat> what God wants is volunteers and not conscripts you can be conscripted you can do the job that's not what God wants he wants volunteers and here is one his very name means that he's a volunteer in the divine service and so was Jehu but what was Jehu's problem let's conclude with this summary of Jehu this comes out of the king's notes Jehu is one of the most curious characters to appear in the record of the kings. He manifested an unquenchable zeal for Yahweh while undertaking the mission of annihilating Ahab's house, but then casually reintroduced the apostasy of Jeroboam, completely ignoring the law of God concerning Israel's worship. The cool and calculated ruthlessness with which he accomplished the vengeance of God upon Ahab's house is a clear indication of the real essence of of Jehu's character. God commended him for destroying the house of Ahab. In fact, he gave him four generations on the throne as a reward, but not for the attitude he adopted in accomplishing it. And that comes from Hosea chapter 1 and verse 4, where Yahweh says, I will avenge the blood of Jehu, the blood shed by... Hang on. Didn't God command him? Yes, he did. The problem was that he relished it. He loved the idea of killing people. He was bloodthirsty. It all does come back in the end, doesn't it, to attitude. The attitude we need to have is the attitude of the one, the man who, who pined, who longed for reformation in Israel. The willing-hearted man, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, who thankfully has some...